<laughs> our, uh, our guest in this segment is Speaker Pro Tem Delegate Paul Espinosa. He's also a Senate candidate. Good, uh, That's a West Virginia Senate, by the way. Good morning, Paul. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Rob. Good morning, John. Good morning, Matt. Good, Good morning. To be with you this Good morning. morning. Good to have you as well. Uh, Paul, uh, as you know, Dylan, our producer, is a substitute teacher, and coming up in uh, about a week or so, he'll get back into the classroom a few days a week. You, too, have spent time as a teacher in the school system. Tell me about your experience. I have. Uh, well, back, uh, first off, uh, when uh, my wife Kathy and I, when we were uh, dating and I was uh, uh, fixing to uh, marry uh, my uh, late father-in-law's daughter, uh, he was a principal at Harpers Ferry Junior High School at the time. This would have been back in the late 80s. And uh, I think one day I was over at the house and, uh, sub, uh, he got the call uh, that uh, he needed a substitute, and after grumbling a little bit, he turned to me and said, "Paul, why don't you substitute teach?" You know, at the time, as you may recall, Rob, I was publicity director at the Charlestown Racetrack mm-hmm. and working most of the evening, so I had my days free, and so he thought that was a perfect opportunity to help fill some of his uh, some of his vacancies there. And uh, after realizing that you know that there was a, a, a option whereby individuals with a, a degree uh, uh, like your colleague there at the R&R, uh, I began substitute teaching and actually enjoyed it. I did it for several years. But then more recently, when I was House Education Chair, my counterpart in the Senate at the time uh, uh, in the, uh, had shared with me that uh, uh, Chairman uh, Mann, uh, Kitty Mann, uh, from um, – I'm trying to think which uh, county is uh, one of the southern counties there. I think uh, I think uh, Matt uh, Harvey's uh, a former stop at Grands down there. He had indicated to me or shared with me that he was doing some substitute teaching and asked if I had, and I and I shared this story that I just shared with you. And uh, long story short, uh, I um, uh, decided, well, you know, it probably wouldn't be bad, to, you know, as House Education Chair to try to do some substitute teaching and. I did uh, register in both Be- Jefferson and Berkeley counties, and as I recall, I think I probably ended up teaching in about 18 different schools. I purposefully tried to, rather than focus on one you know, particular school, I tried to hit as many schools as I could in Jefferson and Berkeley County just to kind of get a sense and, uh, of, of what, uh, you know, what our teachers and uh, service, school service personnel were contending with, and I, I found it a very, very valuable um, experience and also gave me a good opportunity to talk with a lot of our teachers and and uh, school service personnel to you know hear from them hear their concerns and and also hear their suggestions as to how we can continue to try to make our traditional public education system as strong as it possibly can be can you think of anything specific paul that you took from that experience that also was something that you tried to implement while you were in the legislature as the education chair one of the things that uh, I've always been an advocate for is trying to push as much local decision making down to, to the counties as possible. Uh, you know, West Virginia has been recognized as being uh, a pretty top heavy, very bureaucratic uh, type of of uh, agency and um, or state. You know, with a uh, you know a uh, centrally located uh, decision making. Uh, so. That's been kind of the theme uh, that I kind of approached, uh, you know, my tenure, uh, not only on the House Education Committee and then later as chair of the House Education Committee, is to, wherever possible, try to, you know, try to decentralize some of that decision making. What one of the things that I really strongly advocated for, uh, as soon as I became aware of how centralized West Virginia was uh, in its uh, education decision making, was uh, Amendment Four, uh, which would have uh, given the legislature rulemaking authority, just as we have for uh, virtually every other agency in state government. And unfortunately, that uh, that failed to uh, win approval. I think it was probably largely in part uh, due to the fact that Amendment 2 went down. And it's always difficult to, you know, to really help uh, educate folks as to you know, why there's a need for amendment. And uh, so uh, that's certainly something that... Uh, uh, that I've advocated for is you know, trying to trying to have local decision making. Another thing that uh, I was uh, very pleased to lead uh, uh, efforts for was um, returning our local RISAs to their their in, an initial intended purpose. So those RISAs have become very very bureaucratic, at least in my opinion. And whereas they were initially designed to be 
entrepreneurial and uh, intended to allow counties to work together, pool their resources in order to share uh, you know, certain expenses uh, and uh, provide those uh, certain services more economically to counties. It had really bloated uh, to uh, you know being uh, probably you know one of the the uh, largest aspects uh, of the uh, state school board budget or the Department of Education budget. Uh, I actually was a lead sponsor of legislation, or I, I, I probably wasn't lead sponsor because uh, we I had sponsored legislation to you know try to revive reform our RESAs, but then the governor introduced some legislation, and so. We decided that it would probably be a good uh, a good uh, approach to amend our uh, language into a reform bill that the governor had introduced. And uh, uh, I think, as I recall, I think it might have been House Bill 2711 a few years ago. And so we were able to get that provision in uh, state code that, again, uh, now there's very little state funding for what are now known as education cooperatives. But it still provides that that opportunity for counties to work together, and I'm very pleased that um, many of our counties are working together to uh, share expenses and uh, provide those services, uh, you know, in a much more economical fashion than than perhaps they were in the past. Matt Miller, uh, you talk, uh, Paul, about the the kind of top down philosophy that that has tended to be uh, thought of here in the Mountain State and wanting more local control. Can you tell us a little more about the state board of education and kind of its role? How much does it pass down things to counties that need to be done, or how much does it kind of monitor to make sure that counties are doing what is supposed to be done? Yeah, and, and I'll. Let me preface my remarks, uh, Matt, by saying that you know I think our current school board I think is doing a um, a, a good job. I, I I have a good relationship with them and uh, President Hardesty. I think is yeah, I think he's bringing the right uh, approach to the to the uh, state school board. Same thing uh, with uh, our Department of Education. I think Michelle Blatt uh, recently appointed uh, a state superintendent. Uh, I've had a great relationship with her, and I think she'll. Uh, continue to provide uh, excellent leadership to the department. Uh, I, th- I, I do think that you know we continue to have a fairly centralized uh, uh, school system uh, in uh, West Virginia, but uh, I think they they are uh, generally respectful of the legislature trying to empower our local school boards. And so when we do pass legislation, even though the state school board continues to have the ultimate say, I think in state school policy. Uh, I think they are trying to be uh, responsive. And, uh, for example, uh, this, uh, this legislative session, uh, one of the uh, major pieces of legislation that we enacted was the Third Great Success Act. And I think there was really broad agreement between the legislature and the state school board and the Department of Education that we need to provide additional resources, particularly in those early grades. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure each of you are familiar with the, with the uh, the metrics that indicate that if a student is not reading at grade level by the time they enter in fourth grade, uh, his or her chances for uh, future success in their public education are diminished uh, considerably. And so, you know, providing additional needed resources, it's certainly something that I heard from folks when I was uh, substitute teaching in the, in the, uh, in the school system, particularly in some of those longer, uh, younger grades. And uh, so, I think all that, uh, while you know, structurally we can debate you know, what the best structure is, I think there is good cooperation right now between the state school board, the Department of Education, and the legislature. You mentioned the addition of aids in the classroom to help with those younger grades and to get those reading scores and so forth up with uh, already a teacher shortage. Um, are you getting any early reports of how well those positions have been able to be filled or its impact or where we are even in that teacher shortage? I know we heard a little bit yesterday from Dale Lee with one of the teachers unions. Yes, I, I've had uh, a number of conversations with uh, rank and file uh, educators and um, uh, local uh, school board leadership, and uh, I, frankly, I really wasn't surprised to hear that. You know, while certainly we're getting some additional aids in those lower grades, uh, some of those aids are coming from other positions uh, in the school system, and I think that was one of my concerns. While I was certainly 
you know, happy to support that legislation. Uh, Senate uh, Education Chair Amy Grady, who herself is a uh, believe still a fourth grade teacher. I think she's been in the school system for 15 or 16 years now, and I know she's been on your program. She was a, a strong advocate for that legislation, as was our House Education Chair, Joe Ellington, and Speaker Roger Hanshaw. Uh, that was one of my concerns all along, is knowing that there's already a shortage of personnel in the school system, you know, where, where we were going to uh, identify these additional candidates, and uh, uh, that is, you know, I, I, I suspected that that was going to be a challenge, and in fact, it, it, it is a challenge. So, uh, I think that's something where, you know, I think we all need to do our very best to try to encourage uh, uh, folks, uh, you know, particularly folks that uh, maybe are retired or looking for an opportunity to give back to the communities to maybe consider being a classroom aide and, and assisting in some of these roles. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Paul. Over the course morning, of the last uh, couple of weeks, certainly the last few shows at the beginning of the new school year, we talk a lot about the frustrations that are happening in, in the school system from recruitment and, and retention of teachers and what have you. So putting the, the pay issues aside, there are a lot of other issues, such as as just truancy and uh, discipline problems and what have you. And we've talked to folks on the school board. We've talked to you know across the board. Everybody recognizes the problem, and and we hear phrases that begin with "We need to," "Parents need to." There's a lot of churn, but. I'm not hearing a lot of solutions. You know, we, we, we need to make kids come to school more. We need to get parents more involved. In there, we need to come up with, with a strategy to how to make these things happen. Where does the split occur between what the legislature can do on these issues versus the school board versus the local superintendents versus the school principals? Well, as I, as I shared, John, I, I do think that we have a, a, a good level of cooperation between the state school board, the uh, Department of Education, and uh, the legislature. Um, you know, I think really, John, I think, you know, when, when I look around the state and look at school systems, uh, certainly there are challenges, uh, you know, based on just societal issues. But if, if I had to put my finger on what makes the difference between, you know, a very successful school and, and maybe a school that is not, you know, quite as successful. I, I think it often comes down to leadership. I think uh, when I look at school systems, and I saw this as, as, as I was a uh, substitute teacher, and I'd be uh, uh, interested to, to hear, uh, is your colleague's first name Dylan, did you say, Rob? Yes, Dylan is our uh, producer's first name. I, uh, I'd be interested to know his take if he feels comfortable saying it, but I know I could walk into certain schools and you could just kind of tell that it was a well-run school. I mean, just that, uh, you know, the principal and the senior leadership in a school, you know, had a pretty good uh, regimen, you know, in that particular school. And uh, other schools, maybe not so much, you know. And so I do often think that it comes down to leadership. Uh, another piece of legislation that I was uh, very happy to uh, 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 sponsor, uh, serve as the lead sponsor for, was helping to identify and develop, you know, our next generation of school leaders, because that is probably, I think, one of the, in addition to the investments that you need to make in a school system, and, you know, I think despite sometimes what we hear, you know, from, from individuals about, you know, the lack of funding for our public education system, keep in mind that West Virginia probably uh, one of the top spenders per student in the nation. I think the U.S. average of how much we spend per student in West Virginia, at least as of a year or so ago, I think the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce have put together a pretty nice uh, uh, survey or, or a little summary of, of education in, in the United States and in West Virginia. The U.S. average is about $11,462 per student. West Virginia we were actually ranked 14th in the country at 14274 per student. So, you know, you look at us, you know, as what we're paying per student. I mean, we are making investments. It really comes down to a matter of, you know, how we're using those investments. And, you know, a lot of that is going to come down to, you know, how our, our schools are being led and uh, 
uh, I am, uh, you know, pleased that we put in some legislation to help develop that next generation of school leadership. Dylan, I think a moment ago, Paul was asking about your opinion on um, walking into a different school and seeing if you can get a take right away what uh, it might be like. I don't think it takes too long to to figure out. There's definitely differences between some schools and the others, and I, I guess you could point that to leadership at, at the school. But uh, yeah, I won't name any names. But there are Me certainly some, <laughs> yeah, right. There there are certainly some schools where after one or two trips to the school, it's not necessarily the students uh, that are the issue but you just kind of walk in and like mm, this isn't one of the schools that i'm going to be prioritizing as one of the ones i'll come back to i think one of the other things that i often you know, try to remind folks you know when we talk about school funding you look at our state general revenue budget and i know i've shared some of these numbers with you rob and, and your uh, your co-host there before you look at our general revenue budget which is a little over 4.6 uh, billion dollars Forty-four uh, percent, the lion's share of that uh, general revenue budget does go to public education. Uh, another twenty-five percent goes to you know health and human resources, and then about ten percent goes to higher education. So you know that's you know uh, for education, both public and uh, higher education, you know that's over half of our general revenue budget is going to that. Again, with the lion's share going to to uh, public education, and you know. Uh, I guess you, you could always say, well, you know, we need to do more. We need to do more. But as I've kind of shared, and I think the numbers bear this out, uh, compared to the U.S. average, West Virginia is making considerable investments, you know, 14th in the nation in, that, in, uh, in, in education. Are we getting the return on that investment that we should? Uh, I don't think anybody could be happy with the results that we're seeing. Certainly, COVID had a... Uh, uh, considerable impact on those results, but uh, again, I think if you look at the number, any fair, if you look at the uh, the metrics, any fair assessment would didn't, would, would 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 confirm that you know th these challenges have gone well below COVID. I mean, just uh, we we are consistently failing too many of our our, our students. And uh, while I've been a very strong advocate for uh, school choice, uh, providing our parents and students additional options. Uh, I certainly uh, concede and agree uh, and believe that we have to do better in our traditional public education system because that's where most of our students are going to matriculate. And uh, while I'm very pleased that West Virginia has gone from last to near uh, first in providing uh, additional options for parents and students, uh, the most, because most students are going to attend traditional public schools, we, we need to do more, and uh, that's why I was very pleased to support the uh, Third Grade Success Act to, again, help uh, ensure that we're, we're doing better uh, in uh, helping our, our, uh, particularly our young students, be prepared for their future education. Paul, I want to ask you about that Third Grade Success Act because I've gotten two different answers from people who I would expect would be experts on this. In regards to the placement of AIDS, Delegate Mike Hornby on the Education Committee told me that the local school systems had the choice as to where they wanted to place these AIDS, first, second, or third grade. When I talked to Dale Lee yesterday, the president of the WVEA, he seemed to say that it was first grade where all these AIDS would be started statewide, and then as they go along, we'll add second grade and then third grade. What is the real answer on this, do you know? I can tell you what I, I understand to be the case. I think there is some flexibility there uh, because of the fact that there are some school systems across West Virginia that already had AIDS, you know, in uh, certain grade levels or at least had a, a number of AIDS in certain grade levels. And so rather than mandate that, you know, all school systems across West Virginia had to devote these funds for AIDS that in some cases they already had, there is flexibility to my understanding to uh, provide aids in other grades if in fact uh, you know they've already provided a uh, sufficient number of aids in their uh, in their first grade classroom so i think there is some flexibility there with the understanding that if a if school system doesn't already have aids that that's where those dollars should go paul who's in charge of 
of coming up with the strategy for solving the problem. We've got, I'm looking at the Facebook feed now and I'm remembering the conversations from yesterday. There's, everybody laments the fact that, you know, back when we were kids, mom was always home. When you got in trouble at school, you got in trouble at, at the house. You know, that level of parental involvement that, that we all miss. By all indications, that ain't coming back. So we need to, it seems to me, design solutions that that accept the new reality as real. And when I see that we're spending, you know, that we're 14th in spending on per capita student, per capita spending on students, I think that's lovely. But when we're 48th, 49th, 50th, whatever it is in performance, that's that's quite a disconnect. So within the structure of, of the state of West Virginia, be, again, between legislature and school board and what have you, who's, who actually holds the, the controls for how to fix the problem? Well, you know, under our, under our West Virginia Constitution, I think it's pretty clear that the state school board has the uh, primary responsibility uh, for, you know, administering our schools. But it has to be done, you know, in a uh, manner uh, which is consistent with state law. And that's where I think it really requires the collaboration that uh, I think, fortunately, we, we are uh, seeing here in West Virginia between the legislature, the state school board, and the Department of Education. So I think it's a it's certainly a share. It has to be a shared effort, and uh, I do think that we are working uh, working together. Uh, as I noted, uh, I think Michelle Blatt is our uh, new uh, superintendent of schools. I think she uh, just extremely able. Again, I I can recall during my uh, tenure as house education chairman, working very closely with, with Michelle. I just I always thought Michelle was just just. Uh, 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 just very professional, very knowledgeable, uh, very you know uh, straight shooting, and so I think uh, I think with her leadership, I, I, I look for us to continue to be able to advance policies that uh, she and her team and the uh, state school board believe uh, are needed in order to continue to uh, move the needle on our school performance. So I will really look to uh, you know our. Our leadership, uh, like Michelle, and and also our lo local school leadership. Uh, I've had some preliminary discussions with our new superintendent of schools here in Jefferson County. Uh, uh, I've pledged uh, to him that uh, certainly want to collaborate with him and his team, and, and he's uh, reciprocated and expressed uh, his desire to do that and really do our very best to empower our, our local leadership to make the decisions that uh, that they know need to be made in order to uh, improve our education results. And Paul, by the way, that's uh, Dr. Chuck Bishop. He'll be on the show Friday morning at 8 o'clock, the new superintendent of schools in Jefferson County. Paul, thank you so much for coming on the program. Uh, final word is yours. Well, always good to be with you, and certainly it's an important con uh, 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 topic. I think uh, you know there, there's nothing more important than helping ensure that our students are getting that good early start and uh, I've been very pleased to support and work for passage of legislation that I think, uh, you know, helps uh, in that regard. I don't think there's really a silver bullet. It's, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's sometimes referred to as almost silver buckshot. You have to kind of take multiple approaches, and I think that's what the legislature has tried to do, working very closely with the Department of Education and the state school board, and certainly uh, stand ready to continue to collaborate uh, for the benefit of our children. Thank you, Paul. Have a great day. You too. 831, that is uh, Delegate Paul Espinosa, Speaker Pro Tem, and a candidate for the West Virginia State Senate.